want to share uh, scripture together. If you have a copy of the Bible, I invite you to open up to Mark chapter 8. <clears throat> As we do that, I want to share a little story to set this up. Uh, family story. Uh, this picture is a few years old. But when kids are little, often they bond with certain animals, right? A stuffy or some animal that they would cuddle, take naps, sleep with. So for my son, his name is Levi. The center of his world was this stuffed eagle right here. And, you know, two and a half ounces, eight inches long, but like that's the center of his world. And this eagle, he, you know, he naps with him. He goes in the car, in the car seat, even tries to feed him a little bit of soy milk. Who knew that eagles drink soy milk, right? Well, it happened that when that eagle would get dirty, we would have to clean it. And when it's uh, cleaned and it needs to dry, it's wet, and you can't, it's not so comfortable to have it. So what we did in order to avoid a meltdown, my wife went on the internet, because we received this eagle as a gift. We didn't know where it came from. So she goes on the internet. She finds where that's at. She buys a second one. You see the wisdom here, right? The wisdom in moms. We were speaking about this with the uh, group of elders last night, you know. Moms just have their kids all the time. Dads have to clear their schedule to babysit, you know, a little different. But he go, she gets the second eagle. And so that way, when one is dirty and, dry, and drying, she can switch it out with the second one. They're identical. But the key is not letting him know that there's two eagles. Are you with me? So you can see where this is headed. Uh, but the day came, and I wasn't there at the time. My wife was home with, uh, with him, and uh, she put the first eagle that was dirty on the sidewalk that goes from our front door to the car, to the driveway. And she switched out and gave him the second one. So they were going to a store, and Levi, you know, he's less than two. He walks out there with his eagle, and he looks over, and he sees the same thing on the ground. Then he looks back, and he looks down, He's like, eagle, eagle, eagle. He's so confused and so blown away that there's two of these, right? It's like a parent looking at twins, like what happened here? <laughs> and so his entire world is being changed because before that moment, he only saw one half of reality. He only saw one half of what his father and his mother had for him. But through time and through experience, he discovered that there's more to reality, to reality than he thought, right? In fact, there's two halves to, to this reality. And so I want to ask this question before breakfast. Are you a two-eagle disciple? And in the context of the Gospel of Mark, are you someone who not only believes Jesus is the Messiah, but believes that he's the Son of God? And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 8. And we're going to look at the two confessions of, of uh, Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> so this is really the high point, the turning point of, of, this, of the Gospel of Mark. Peter declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. And interestingly, it happens not in Jerusalem, not in a church or a temple, but it happens as they're going somewhere else. You know, the key conversations of Jesus happen in the stuff of everyday life. What should that tell us about what it means to live and to make disciples? And what should we celebrate in our churches, the activity that our members engage with? And so starting in verse 27, it says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? Jesus asked questions that he knows the answer to, as was mentioned yesterday to draw out the understanding of those who are listening. And you know, someone said a good uh, picture, uh, pic a picture is worth a thousand words. And I'd like to, th to think of it that a good question is worth a thousand answers. People are going to integrate and apply and remember the things that they discovered, not the things that they were told. And there's an interesting book, it's called Conversion in the New Testament, and it contrasts the conversion of the Apostle Paul with the conversion of the 12. And it basically says your view of conversion drives your view of discipleship, isn't it true? And so you see those two basic streams of event-oriented evangelism and discipleship and process-oriented that we see here with the disciples. And so he says, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. 
This is process of elimination. Sorry, I just lost my spot. <clears throat> so some say, where are we? There we are. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, in order to understand the significance of this, it's important to understand how the Gospel of Mark is structured. So turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. It's very interesting. At the beginning of this Gospel, <clears throat> it tells us what the purpose is and the, the entire structure of, of the Gospel. And this is, uh, we're asking this question in the context of this uh, eagle illustration. Are we two eagle disciples? And so you look in verse 1, it says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, and then it gives them two titles. What are those titles? Jesus the Messiah, or some, your version might say Christ, same thing. And what's the second one? The Son of God. So the first half of the Gospel of Mark asks the question, who is Jesus? And you come to Peter in, in chapter 8, who says he is the Messiah. And interestingly, the Messiah is a component of all the other titles in that first half. So some people see Jesus teach, and they're like, wow, he's a great teacher. Others see him calm the storm, and they say, this man is a prophet. He's the son of David. And then the climax is, he's the Messiah. And that con confession was made by a Jewish believer, Peter. But then you have the second half of the, of the book and ask the question, what does it mean to be Messiah? And the answer, the confession, comes not from a Jewish uh, believer, but from a Gentile believer, the centurion at the cross. And he says, truly this man was the Son of God. So Mark chapter 1, verse 1 tells us that Jesus is both Messiah and he's Son of God, you see? And so to believe in God is not about religion or irreligion. It's for the whole world. Isn't that beautiful? Whether you're religious background like Peter or you're a non-religious background, I heard uh, uh, Sylvia's story, beautiful story. The gospel is for the whole world in the East and the West that sit down together. And so these are the two confessions. Now, right before Mark chapter, the confession of Jesus as Messiah, there's a, there's a short story there where it says a man was blind. We don't have to read it with time, but uh, someone came along and they spit in his eyes. Jesus came along and spit in his eyes, touched his eyes, and it said the man could see, but only partially, right? That's meant to illustrate the disciples before the cross, the disciples understanding that Jesus is Messiah, but not Son of God. It's like a young boy that they shared at the beginning who's clutching an eagle in his hand, not realizing that there's a second eagle. There's a whole nother aspect to reality. And so isn't that how it is today that often many of us and those that we minister among, they see Jesus as Messiah. They see someone who's come to fix things and it has come for them, but they don't see the aspect of him as son of God who went to, be, to suffer to be rejected and to die, which means we're called in response to live on mission. And so it says here, as we move on back in Mark chapter 8, <clears throat> immediately after this confession by Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, notice what happens. Let me turn back there. <clears throat> okay, verse 31 right after the confession of Jesus as Messiah. It says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And so immediately after they say that, uh, Peter says, Jesus is Messiah, he says, now I want you to understand what that means, right? And to put it into language in our, in our time, we could be people that love Jesus, people that are engaged in ministry, giving financially, involved in a lot of activity, but if we're not living a life of mission in response to the suffering of Christ, 
we only see one half of who he really is, right? We don't see that second ego. We don't see that other aspect to life. And Jesus goes on to, uh, or, let, or let me just add those key words that we just read, suffering, rejected, killed. So the, 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 the Jews, basically, their concept of a Messiah is someone that wins. Messiahs don't lose, they win, right? I mean, we're in the election season in my country. We could really get off track here. But the point is, we're looking for a president that's going to come and win, right? We want someone who's going to fix Social Security, someone who's going to secure the value of the currency, someone who's going to address racism and add jobs and do all these things. And that's their concept of a Messiah. It's someone who wins. And so Jesus comes along, and it's very interesting because in the Old Testament, as far as I know, there are many places that talk about Messiah, and there are many places that talk about suffering in, the, in, in, the, in our life. But there's no one passage that uses the word Messiah and the notion of suffering together, intertwined, you see? And so Jesus comes along and he says, you call me Messiah, rightly so. You believe, you're a church member, you're involved in ministry, that's great. But you need to go to the cross. You need to be willing to follow me and, and, and confess that I'm the son of God. And you only see that in the context of mission. And so he goes on to say that it's easy, uh, or he goes on to say that whoever wants to save his life will lose it. You know, someone said that it will cost you something to be a disciple, but it will cost you everything not to be a disciple, right? So it's easy and appealing to try to save our lives, is it not? I mean, think about all the ways we do it. You know, there's so many. You know, one way we try to do it is through safety. You know, that's the essence of an idol is a good thing that you turn into a God thing and it ends up becoming a bad thing. And some people are so focused on safety. If I could just, you know, keep my family safe and I could raise them in a Seventh-day Adventist uh, congregation and the children's programming and they could, you know, go through the system in school and eventually marry someone else and then repeat. And that does not to say that they don't love Jesus, but they have not engaged the world that Jesus has sent us into. Safety. Another way we try to do it uh, is through ministry. I've seen it time and time again, when you, if you're struggling in church and things just are very plateaued or are declining, we think, you know, if we just knew each other better, if we just had more social events, right? And so we try to create all these opportunities to, to connect and to socialize and get to know one another, but trying to hold a church together through social, I think of it like going to the beach and trying to pick up an armful of sand. And in spite of your best intentions, that thing's going to evaporate right before your eyes. There's only one remedy for the Christian life and for a plateaued church, and that's aggressive mission. Amen? What else do you see? How else do you grow spiritually but then being engaged with people, not just believing that Jesus is Messiah, but believing that he's the Son of God, being willing to follow him? And many other things that I was looking at sharing with the interest of time, I'm going to go to the end. I want to share a story with you of someone who's inspired me in my life. <clears throat> this is my grandfather, my grandparents. And uh, Lewis and Virginia Stubbs. And interestingly, let me see what other picture, I guess I didn't get the other one. Um, but just an amazing story. You know, we all have those that have had a real impact on us. <clears throat> My grandfather was a World War II vet, um, s served in Europe. And when he came back to the States from the war, he met my grandma, and in <laughs> three weeks, they were engaged. In two months, they were married. And then they had six kids pretty much back to back. So I like to say my grandfather's a man of action, right? Uh, in many ways, uh, just lo lovely people. So he's a pharmacist. He was a pharmacist by trade, but he loves Jesus. He's one of those people that just takes Jesus you know, at his word and willing to do whatever he asks. So they had moved to uh, Florida in Orlando, worked for a place called Florida Hospital. He's one of their first pharmacists there. And he became engaged with a local church there 
and was the help starting that church up. Today, that church is the Forest Lake Church, and it has over 4,000 members. Huge church. So that church got, you know, above three, 400 people, and he's like, this church is too big. We got to go out and do something else. And so he had his pilot's license, and he saw in the newspaper there was some land for sale in South Carolina. All right? Now, I don't know... You know, the, the, if you know the geography, that's a long ways away. So he gets his wife in his plane and flies from Orlando to South Carolina over this property and lands and walks it. And he's like, this would be a great place to live because we could plant a church here. We don't have a church. And in that day and age, they used to call it dark counties. I don't know if you, if that, uh, you don't have counties here in terms of the local, but the local area, they would say there's, that's a place where there's not an Adventist church. So he moves his family there. And this is at the age of 55, okay? If you love Jesus, your children are going to make new friends if you're faithful to mission. I see it time and time again. People would say, oh, we would love to be involved with that church project, Anthony, and we'd love to be engaged with that. But our kids have friends. You know, I took, I took up, when we moved this last move, my son was sad because he had other friends and his, his um in the church there where we planted, even though he's young. And so I set him down, and I held up a penny, and I held up a quarter. And I said, Levi, if you could only pick one of these, which one would you pick? And we're working on currency, you know. So he said, I'd pick the quarter. It's worth 25 pennies, 25 cents in our denominations. And, he's, and I said, that's right. Why? Ah, oh, because it's worth more. And I said, if you could, I said, the quarter represents Jesus and, and following him. The penny represents just living for ourself, being selfish. If you pick the quarter, you can always have more pennies in terms of friends. But if you pick the penny, you're never going to have the quarter. You know, getting that mindset that we're not here just to preserve our own little social group. We're here for mission. And so my grandfather went up there in uh, his mid-50s. They planted a church that, um, as of a few, of, that, that grew and did well. And as a few, as of a few years ago, um, Dale Earnhardt's cousin pastors that church. I don't, you know, NASCAR is not as big in in Australia, but just an amazing thing that happened there. Then he gets up to his, let's see, it would have been early '80s, and he's like, "This church is big enough." You know, there's enough people around here. We need to go start something else. And he's not doing it as some people, you know, it could be cranks, like, hey, we just don't like this. We don't get along. He's like, we got to go start something else. Think of that in your early 80s. And so <coughs> he and my grandma move. It's about three hours away to Clemson University on the coast there in the Carolinas. And he's like, we got to reach university students. So him and his uh, grandma and grandpa, they take... They go to the store, they buy a bunch of sports drinks, Gatorade, and they put a little label to the little small group that they started in their house on there. And they go to registration in the middle of August in the blazing heat, right? We got our seasons reversed. It is humid. It is hot. And they're there pulling this cooler of Gatorade so that they can be outside where those students are lined up and can talk to them and hand them their, their little drink with their card in it. And my grandpa tells me the story. He's like, Anthony, what do you think? I said, honestly, I think you're crazy, but I like it, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, who does that, right? So they start a little group in their house. You know, there's some other people that come and help them out, and God does this, and God does that. He's a pharmacist. He's not a vocational pastor. Some of the best opportunities to connect with people in mission happen when you're not a pastor, right? We spoke about this before. You guys, as elders, you can say, I'm a teacher. I'm an ordained plumber. I'm a uh, graphic arts designer, whatever the case may be. God's using you on the mission. And you have an, an authentic integrity in the way you can go about making friends. I mean, I idolize that. What do I say about my work environment, right? I go to some meetings, you know, I'm a pastor. And so they went and did that. And... Um, I think I have another picture on here. It's hard to see. There's some write-up on them, and that's a uh, stone church building there that they ended up with. You know, it's a little different if you're in an urban area or a rural area, but the point is that you do it, right? I look at my grandfather, and I say, wow, there's some methods he uses. I don't know if I would use those, but at the end of the day, it's not about that. 
because you can reach people in a three-piece suit or in a t-shirt and shorts. You can reach people singing hymns, singing contemporary Christian music. You can reach people having church in a building under a steeple or having church in a house under a chimney because you want to build your church around the gospel, not a method. Are you with me? You build your church around a method, then when the method fails, you're like, oh, we didn't demonstrate what we wanted to demonstrate. You build your church around the gospel, you can make course corrections as you need to because it's not about the methods, it's about the message of Jesus Christ. And so fast forward now, six months ago, and unfortunately my grandfather came down with pancreatic cancer and he had it for about two years. And um, you know, when you have cancer, uh, you don't die from cancer. You die from all the other systems that shut down and things that happen. And so I went to speak at his funeral. This was about six months ago. And about 10 years before, when I started as a pastor, I, I did an interview with him and asked him to share with me lessons that he's learned about ministry. I have it with me. I'm not going to read it. But one of the things he said in there that stood out to me, he said, no matter how you do it, Go with God, don't go with the formulas, right? I think that's good advice. Learn as much as you can. What's that? Especially from a pharmacist. From a pharmacist. Yes, I didn't think of it. The formula was very intentionality with the language. But you guys see what it's about. Learn all that you can about strategies and ideas and all that. But at the end of the time, go with God. And he was someone that demonstrated that to me. Because I can remember as a young child... Our summertime, going to grandma and grandpa's house, they li you know, lived in the mountains, and we'd go uh, cliff jumping and do all these fun things. But every morning, my grandfather would get up, he would go behind the house, and he would build a fire, and he would worship God. And I remember uh, particularly one um, time, I was about 10 years old, I got up in the morning, I saw him go outside, and I didn't really know what he was doing, so... Yeah, I just love being outside. So I got up, I follow him, I go out there, and he's got a fire, and he's sitting around this fire, and I said, Grandpa, what are you doing? And so he talked with me a little bit, just explained, you know, the rhythm of his life and what he does. And I'll never forget, he put his hand on me, and he said, Anthony, no matter what happens in life, no matter what challenges that I encounter, I will always worship God. That's what it's about, right? He said, no matter what, I will always worship God. And so he and many others in my life and your life are examples of people that are two eagle disciples. They not only know that Jesus is Messiah, he's the one who came for us to, to save us, but they know that he's the son of God who went to the cross, was rejected, suffered, persecuted, and killed. And their life lives in response to that reality. So if we want to just stay with that one eagle, only see one half of reality, it's going to end up costing us everything. But if we live on mission, it's going to cost you a lot. But you're going to have the joy in the experience of following Christ and his mission. And so I want to just share that with you this morning um, from the Gospel of Mark. Don't ever be ashamed to follow Jesus even if it costs you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day and for all that is ahead of us, not only today, but each and every day. And I pray that we, as a people, would be known as those who, no matter what, we will always worship God. And we do it not with a sense of duty and obligation. We do it with a sense of joy and celebration because you sacrificed for us. You gave, you poured out the riches of heaven on our behalf, and you were willing to do it just for the joy of being with us. And you cared more about us having a relationship with the Father than you maintaining your own relationship with the Father. It's a love that's far beyond anything we can comprehend. We can't explain it, we can't fully understand it, but we can experience it. 
And so in the life of each and every person here, Lord, may we um, live as double eagle disciples, both confessions of who you are, not only Messiah, but Son of God, not only that you are there for us, but you work through us into the world. That's our prayer, and we just pray a blessing on uh, breakfast and the rest of the meetings today and uh, the continued agenda here. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.